Rob J gave me an incredibly generous one year's worth of subscriptions on Patreon and brings you today's video. Castrol the Windcrested versus Kineo Centero, the infamous Cruel Claw, and Linden. A three lander, and we do have birds in our hands, so I think we can start off with this one. We draw into an Arcane Signet on turn two, so I'll probably get that down on turn three, followed by Watcher of the Spheres. But I'd like to get some land ramp with the Cartographer's Hawk if we can. Just lands for the other two players, and the first spell we see is a Howling Mind, so we'll assume that this is a group hug deck from Kineos and Tiro. So we draw a land and another bird. So let's go planes. We can go for the Cartographer's Hawk here so that we can still swing in with it next turn, or we could go for the Arcane Signet into the Judge's Familiar. I think I'm fine going with the land ramp as opposed to the artifact ramp. Idol of Oblivion for the Mono White player. So we assume he's going for Mono White Weenies. And a little bit of Soul Sister shenanigans in this. It's good that Infamous is last in the turn order because we want to get down as many blockers as we can potentially. Although not seen too many creatures so far. Excellent new equipment, Brotherhood Regalia, so makes it even more difficult to block the Infamous. Vision Skeens has us draw more cards. So we draw into Warden of Evos Isle, making our Flyers cost less, which might be relevant if we want to bounce this back to hand. A Murmuration as well. So we're going to have to start cherry picking which cards we want to keep here. Draw a Raven's Warning and a Raise the Palisade. So throw down the a Gunjo. Oh, actually, I shouldn't have thrown that down before this, but I'm not entirely sure I want to bounce it back to hand now, to be honest. So... What do we do here? Do we just go for a couple of birds and then we can try and get our commander into play? We can't get it into play next turn without an arcane signet. Thinking of cheating birds into play with our commander now that we've got our handful. So let's accelerate our mana one way or another. Play out the arcane signet and watcher of the spheres. And I will swing in at the group hug player, even though we won't get the land ramp here. So we'll only have to discard one card. I think it has to be the Emeria Angel. Not a card that we can cheat into play with our commander. Neither is the Consecrated Sphinx. Um, I wonder if there might be reanimation with the Infamous deck. Might be risky discarding a Consecrated Sphinx, but not entirely sure we're going to need it against this group hog player. Oketra's Monument, arguably the best monument in Commander. Not where the lands over here. There's a Mistvale Plains in order to put something back in the library. A monumental Henge is a means of card advantage potentially in the later game. Anyway, risk throwing down the Infamous without being able to equip the Brotherhood Regalia, so no ward on this yet. I'm wondering if it'll be worth getting down the Murmuration if we're able to start discounting our Flyers, especially if we get both the Warden and the Watcher into play at the same time. If we can cast multiple spells in a turn, Murmuration just gets better and better. Anyway, discarded to hand size and Ulamog there, so the graveyard was shuffled back into the library. So we do know that this guy has Eldrazi Titans in his list now, which he might not have wanted to show us. Players might have had spot removal or draw into spot removal for this. A Bloom Tender, seeing a Rainbow Veil, which isn't a land I've seen before, can hand that over to another opponent when you tap it for a mana of any colour. So here we see another land and a Rhystic Study. Don't think we're going to be keeping hold of that somehow. So are we just setting up with the Murmuration at this point? Maybe we do just take advantage and get some land ramp here as well. Like we arguably should have done last turn. I wasn't sure that we weren't going to throw down our commander is the thing. I think we want to get down the Murmuration here as opposed to the commander. Contrary to what I thought previously. Because we don't have that many birds to cheat in. So let's just arbitrarily attack down the middle, because we're worried about Eldrazi from this guy. So throw out the island. And Murmuration is just going to make one bird for us. And then let's play the Murmuration, as we said. So missing out on land ramp with this thing. This is the thing I was kind of scared of when putting this in the deck. I think it's still worth having in here, but the fact that we have to recast it so often, I think it's actually not going to be that great in the early game, but better in the late game once we can, you know, put triggers on the stack and cheat it back into play immediately with the Castrel. Soul Warden being cast in order to create a warrior with the Alketra's Monument, so we were right that it is Soul Sisters and White Weenies. Draws a card with Idol of Oblivion after making a token, because 
Eight cards in hand isn't enough apparently. Maybe he was really unlucky and didn't have a land, but manages to play a Windswept Heath. So that suggests that he cares about the top cards of his library sometimes, because it is a monocolored deck of course. I may well see the commander here. No, instead we see a Welcoming Vampire for two mana. So again, wants to see more of the card draw. A Skull Clamp from this player as well, really worried about losing out on the card draw from the Group Hug player at some point, who may just scoop out of nowhere, you never know. Anyway, the Infamous is now equipped, so Ward 2 and can't be blocked. And then a Lightning Greaves as well, really wants to protect his commander. Seven cards in hand, but only one mana held up. So we'll see if he's got a Vamp Tutor or something. Imperial Seal. Swings in at us for three. Alright, and with the infamous trigger on the stack, gets himself into Vorat Battlehorns. He did discard a Kozalek in order to uh, cast that for free. So, again, the graveyard was shuffled. But Vorat Battlehorns is just yet another means of making his commander unblockable. And he can't even equip it with the Lightning Greaves attached. So, yeah, seems as though he doesn't have any tutors in hand to stack the top card of his library, thankfully. Consecrated Sphinx for our opponent over here as well, which means if we got our Consecrated Sphinx down, we could bounce draws back and forth forever until one of us said no. Able to tap this down for Simic Mana now, which allows him into a Sylvan Karyatid. Defender Hexproof taps for a mana of any colour. Doesn't have the best colour fixing over here though. Reliquary Tower. Uh, this is handed over to someone when he tapped it for mana. Has Temple of the False God. So only access to two colours at the moment. Hands this over, which means he now controls more lands than us. So yeah, we can swing in over there quite freely if we want the land ramp. So we draw to the draw step. Consecrated Sphinx draws two. And then we draw to Howling Mine. And I dare say that the Sphinx will do the same thing. There's an Airborne Aid. Draw a card for each bird we control. Or actually, it's each bird on the battlefield. I uh, think we're the only one that is going to have birds. We don't have a means of an unlimited hand size in the deck, so we could go for our commander here and then just cheat some birds into play. Maybe set up a raise the palisade. Our commander costs four at the moment, so yeah, just get that into play. Triggers the watcher for plus one plus one until the end of the turn. More life game from the life game player. And then this commander cares about the number of players that you hit in order to get triggers on it. So uh, we've got flyers that we can't necessarily get through uh, we could go yeah probably go through the welcoming vampire all right so that can be a vigilance 4-4 to the left and then these can hit in the middle and that hopefully means that we'll get two triggers with our castrel so hit both players get two triggers now i'm wondering if let's cheat in the judge's familiar and we can cast the warden of evos isle i think and that will maximize the number of spells that we've cast this turn so the first one can be a plus counter on each bird you control. And then this resolves before that. So put a bird onto the battlefield. That resolves. This does mean that we could have, if I planned the turn out better, could have gone for the Warden of Evosal first so that it gets a plus counter. But don't imagine it's going to matter. Just want to maximize the number of spells we cast, like I said. So Soul Warden triggers again. Plus counter on each bird you control. And then we'll go through to the main phase. We end the turn with six cards in hand after we get down the Warden of Evos Isle. And if we manage to keep this board, I imagine that Raise the Palisade is going to do some work for us. Would have maximised the amount of damage that this would have dealt as well, I suppose. So, yeah, again, could have played the turn a little bit better. Get a couple of Storm Crows, thanks to us casting two creatures or any two spells this turn. A Path to Exile goes on to the Consecrated Sphinx, fine with that. Doing that during the upkeep before any draws are made. And it'll be interesting to see if this is more useful. It'll be interesting to see if this is more useful as a one mana bird. Or if it's handy to actually be able to get rid of a spell off the stack. Our opponent is tapping out here. We don't have too much mana floating around. All right, Enlightened Tutor, we can't necessarily counter. It's not worthy as well with the finality counters. We could put with the nesting grounds, maybe do that next turn. Put the finality counter onto something else, and then when it dies, it gets exiled instead. Nice bit of tech you can do there with nesting grounds and the finality counters. Tutors up a caged sun, but goes for the claim jumper, which is a really good one in mono white decks, or boros decks, or any decks that aren't green, basically. 
why it's getting better and better at tutoring up planes. So anyway, Tolkien enters when he casts that, triggers. Of course, Soul Warden gets a card draw from the Welcoming Vampire as well. Draws with the Idol of Oblivion after the Warrior is made, so getting a lot of use out of that old Ketra's Monument. And plays a Fable Passage for the turn as well, so we've got five lands. <laughs> we finally going to trigger the Cartographer's Hawk. Right, Skull Clamp onto the Welcoming Vampire. He might be ready to start blocking that if we send our Flyers in over there. Might be able to one-shot someone if we're lucky with Raise the Palisade, though. Not worthy that he didn't clamp the Warriors, so swings those in towards the um, towards the Rakdos player. Not worthy that he didn't clamp the Warrior token, so swings them in down the middle at the Infamous. Not worthy that the Finality counters do count on any permanents, so if we wanted to point it at something like a Skull Clamp and hope for removal on that, then could get it exiled. And I dare say that there are effects like... Um, Sun Titan in here that could grab it back, so that could be relevant. Anyway, the Rakdos player hard casting an Atali Primal Storm, and it can have haste with the uh, Lightning Greaves here. But if Atali gets him into a board wipe, like I said before, we can now counter it with the Judge's Familiar. So, yeah, you think that this isn't going to be relevant because you generate a decent amount of mana in Commander, and paying the extra one isn't difficult, but you often do see players tapping out. So goes through to combat. We've got 27 damage at the moment, so and we might be able to buff with Watcher. So we'll have to see what our opponent gets into here and if we'll be able to one-shot him next turn or not. Uh, the Atali Primal Storm. We see in the Exile Zone a Pathraiser Ulamog and a Guafa. Guessing that that's from the Atali. Exile from us was a land. And over here, a land as well. Itali's going in at the white player, and we are getting the commander damage. So, chump blocking with a warrior token. Don't think this has trample. No, it doesn't. So, see if the infamous cruel claw gets into anything relevant. <laughs> and there we go. In Garrick's wake. This is exactly what we were waiting for, so sacrifice the bird in order to counter that. And we're going to force them to pay the one, which they obviously can't do at the moment. So it does mean that the Judge's Familiar gets exiled thanks to that finality counter on it, but was well worth having him play apparently. So in Garrick's Wake is successfully countered there and has to hand this over to a player. So might be that the Group Hug player and the Rakdos player bounce this back and forth to each other. Might be that they have some kind of understanding with each other and it does indeed go over to the Four Colour player. Might have a board wipe of his own here, 11 cards in hand. A Reigns of Power, untap all creatures you control. Untap all creatures you control and a target opponent controls. You swap those creatures around and they gain haste until the end of the turn. So swapping with the Rakdos player takes the infamous Cruel Claw, the <laughs> Annihilator 3, the Atali as well. Not whether he does not control the Lightning Greaves, so can't unequip that. There's an Awakening after that. At the beginning of each end step, untap all creatures and lands. Okay, well that's interesting. Don't have don't have anything we can do at flash speed, unfortunately. But this attack might be painful. It means that we're nowhere near one shotting the Mardu player. Oh that's strange, the commanders have been swapped round as well. I don't think you're supposed to swap commanders, are you? Anyway, we get the 9-9 Annihilator and the 3-3 commander for some more commander damage. The Atali's going in at the left. Atali triggers on attacks. So uh, exiled another land from us, that means that a couple of lands have been cleared off the top. A mountain here, and then it was a Ristic Study, and another board wipe in Vanquish the Horde. Does he want to do it? He decides not to, thankfully. Did exile a board wipe from the white player though. And I think we are going to have to give up on, how many lands have we got? Five lands to one, two, three, four, five potentially. Just wondering about sacrificing the Arcane Signet. Do we just play recklessly and take the damage here? Yeah, let's sacrifice some Stormcrow tokens. Could always bring a creature back with the Castrol, I suppose. And then remove the Finality Counter straight away. Yeah, I don't think we're playing any Flyers next turn. Um, let's get rid of the Warden of Evo Sile. And we can try to reanimate that next turn. This does minimise the number of creatures we have as well, unfortunately. So, at Chump, the Pathraiser. Oh, does it have... Oh, of course, it's the... Um, can't be blocked by three or more creatures. It's the Super Menace. So, gonna have to take it, unfortunately. Entirely blocked by the Vigilance Warrior again. 
And then we have an infamous trigger to try and dodge as well. And reveals a regrowth. So our opponent's obviously trying to get into some specific stuff here. And reveals a regrowth. Return a card from graveyard to hand. And decides to point that at the reins of power. So I'm not liking this group hug player very much at the moment. I'm thinking that we're going to have to start trying to deal with him as well. If he's going to be interfering with our boards. The Rainbow Veil triggers again, see if he gives it to the same player. Alright, ends up giving it to us this time, so... Once again, the Cartographer's Hawk. I keep banging on about it, but... Don't think we're going to get the trigger on that here either. Uh, six lands. Uh, this player has six lands. The white player ramped ahead quite nicely, but also has six lands. So untap all creatures and lands at the beginning of every upkeep. Have to bear that in mind for any instance that we might be able to hold up. And there is an Artificer's Assistant. Draw with the Howling Mine as well. Might be that this player can go for like a Rift or something like that, which might be of some relevance. Might be wanting to hold up Counter Magic for something like Raise the Palisade. Uh, so we can't get Land Ramp, which means we can just throw down the Nesting Grounds. So let's just try Raise the Palisade now. Rhystic Study can draw a card, we're not going to bother with that. The white player going for Teferi's Protection or something is fine with me here. He is tapping down mana. Uh, okay, Misvel Plains going for the Path to Exile back into the library. Might as well. Got the surplus mana for it. Might have been tempted to go for the Monumental Henge personally. Alright, well surprisingly this is resolving so we will name Bird. And then everything that is not a bird is going to get bounced. So then we can go for the Artificer's Assistant. And again, draw with Rhystic Study is fine. Just trying to buff up the Watcher of Spheres as best I can here. And then strangely, I think we're going to actually try and draw some cards here. Because we might be able to get into some interactions hold up during our opponent's turns. So as much as I'd like to start trying to get some Alpha Strikes in, I think it behooves us to try and have more cards in hand that we can actually try to protect our board with. So Watcher of Spheres buffed up to a 6-6. Six, six. So maybe it's Commander Damage that's going to be relevant against this guy. Let's go Commander Damage to the right. 3-4 to the left. I'll try and keep the white player on side. A 4-3 down the middle. The 6-6 six, six can go to the right as well. So we're hitting all three opponents here, which means we get all three triggers with the Castrol. Vigilance in these Flying Bird decks is really, really good. And Murmuration doing a lot of work for us, seeing as how we... Took that turn off to get it down. But as I suspected, the four colour player does have something to do. Oh, that's an instant. Okay. Well, there's that. If we're not all looking at this player by now, then... Well, that's going to totally warp the outcome of the game. So, no card draw for us. Do still get the bird tokens at least, but... Yeah, we're doing pretty much nothing here. I'll hand Rainbow Veil over to the mono white player. So, in response, the white player... Going to tap down a lot of his mana and try and do something before the Awakening resolves, which makes total sense. So now goes after the Monumental Henge, sees if he can get anything with that. Has he still got the Caged Sun on top, or did he draw that already? Anyway, shows us a Nykthos, so he's bypassed the Caged Sun, if he did have it on top. I think we might be a turn or two behind on the uh, Mana Doubler there. Doesn't have any Devotion to White whatsoever at the moment. So down comes the Soul Warden, triggers the Elketra's Monument and the Rhystic Study to draw most likely. Noteworthy as well, we do have an activated ability on the Sky Cat Sovereign, so we might as well make a Cat Bird every single turn. Lauren of the Third Path coming in now, so not sure what that's going to be pointed at. Quite a few targets for it. Could go after the Murmuration, but like I said, I'd be very much focusing on this guy personally. The infamous Cruel Claw can do stuff out of nowhere as well. Whereas we are pretty slow at the moment. Plus I've shown no hate towards the mono white player whatsoever. So this will be interesting. Gets pointed at the Rhystic Study. That's a fair enough target. I'll just make the Cat Bird now in response. <laughs> and for those of you who've never seen the token before. Welcoming Vampire back into play again. So arguably could have gone for the Welcoming Vampire first. And then Soul Warden into that. If he wants to keep drawing loads of cards. But... I mean, he's not really making any use of this Skull Clamp. Maybe he just wants a Flying Blocker in play. Throws out the Nykthos for the turn, now that he's got Devotion to White, but 
can't take advantage of it yet. So throws the clamp back onto the vampire. So that adds credence to the idea that he wants to use it as a blocker. Draws with Idol of Oblivion. And hands the rainbow back to us. So I think it'll be between myself and the white player against these two if we have an understanding. Discards to hand size a couple of planes. Infamous Cruel Claw back into play. Can be unblockable and have haste. Regalia goes on to the Cruel Claw. So does Greaves. And then we see Containment Construct. So uh, that is a Discard Matters card. You may exile it from your graveyard when you discard something. If you do, you can play it this turn. They don't have any mana held up. So I don't think they're going to be making use of that unless they uh, discard and exile a mana crypt or something. So see if he continues to pile on the Commander Damage onto us. Don't think we're going to be able to get many attacks in, unfortunately, because we're being controlled by the Kineos and Tiro player. And I imagine that that continues. Yep, no surprise, he comes in and hits us. Make a token in response, not that we can block with it. So it does indeed hit us, gets a profane tutor off the top, so just tutor something into his hand. Could be far worse. Discards the Pathraiser Ulamog, put back into his hand by our Bounce Wrath that we played previously. Decides not to exile it to the Containment Construct, because obviously it would be stuck in exile then, so... Yeah, may well see some targeted reanimation, mass reanimation at some point. I think I've got those in my infamous Cruel Claw list. So, we'll see if the Group Hug player can do anything at the end step here. The White player going for some more card advantage, I dare say. Monumental Henge, and can still afford the Misvel Plains as well if he wants. Reveals a Hall of Heliod's Generosity, and puts back the Enlightened Tutor. Tidal Barracuda lets us play things at flash speed, so we all have, thanks to that. And the enchantment, a Prophet of Crufix. Can't do anything during this player's turn though, I need to remember that I can activate abilities though. Go for the Skycat Sovereign again. Mono White player goes for the same plays again. Doubt we'll ever see this much use out of a Monumental Henge. Might as well play it in Mono White though. A Wayfarer's Bauble. Throws the Fabled Passage on the bottom, curiously. Noteworthy that Rainbow Veil triggers at the next end step, so with something like the Awakening we could um, tap it down for mana twice before we need to give it away to someone. Can play at flash speed now, thanks to the Tidal Barracuda, so we need to bear that in mind as well. And we'll draw two cards as we have pretty much the entire game. A Mockingbird, new one from Bloomboro that I have very high hopes for, comes down as a copy of any creature on the battlefield. So we could make that a Tidal Barracuda. Then no one can do anything during our turn. Is that worth doing? Does force this player to play some kind of interaction. Is he going to assume that we're going to go for a Tidal Barracuda? And it's worth pointing out with this, it's not X. It's the total mana spent to cast it, which is partly why it's so good. Unfortunately gave up on the Warden of Evos Isle previously. But if we put three mana into X, then it'll be four in total. So X is one immediately, thanks to the discount from this. So basically put three mana in total into it, and then four with this. Means that X is three. Say done. And see if anyone wants to do anything in response to that. The uh, Rakdos player just passing straight through the turn. Oh, I've misplayed it, that's annoying. It's mana spent to cast it, and we didn't spend mana with this, is the error I'm guessing I've made. Ugh, yeah, that's annoying because it was allowed down there, and we could have copied this and given ourselves a clear run. Oh well, we'll just make another Watcher. Yeah, that's something that we're going to have to bear in mind. This is the problem with playing these decks for the first time. You do see the errors that I make, the little tiny intricacies of the decks. But it means that you're learning from my mistakes at least. I did that during the draw phase. Might be able to sneak an Imperian Eagle down at least. The fact that this was allowed down might suggest that there's no... Um, interaction that our opponents are holding up, hopefully. I mean, we'll see. I'm not hopeful <laughs> against the player with 13 cards in hand. So, yep, yeah, here we go. Arcane Signet comes down with Flash. Spectral Searchlight, choose a player. That player adds a mana of any colour. Is he just showing us that he doesn't have anything here? And now the Rakdos player is doing something. Atali coming into play at Flash Speed, trying to potentially put us off attacking him. As long as these two players go down before we do, I'm not particularly bothered about winning this one. <laughs> I wouldn't mind seeing the mono white player win. 
So we'll go through to attacks. And let's assume that we're going to get the Anthem effect into play. Might not be wise to play around it because they could point spot removal at it. But let's say that this is 3, 6 and 9. And then 18 with these. This is 13, 13 right off the bat. So we'll save that till later. 21, 25 and 30. And um, we'll just say that that's going in there as well. So that should be enough with the Anthem. And then this can go in down the middle and the Watcher can as well. And the Vigilance making all the difference in the world here. So see if anything is done in response to attacks. Noteworthy, this is not a bird. It's an elemental cat, but it does make birds. So I decided to hold it in here. And of course, it is massive for only two mana. So well worth having in. And now we see what our opponent might have. A Chaos Warp onto that thing. So now do not have enough damage to get through, which was the risk we were always going to run. Could try drawing cards into a counter spell for that. Might be that we warp into another Anthem effect though. I am very tempted to go for the Airborne Aid there just because it would be funny. I mean, there's lots of birds in play. Do we do that? The thing is, we still don't have enough damage after that onto this player. So I think we still just have to go for Imperian Eagle. We don't have enough damage either way though, do we? Yeah, let's see what happens here with the Chaos Warp. Might be that we get into another Anthem effect. Got plenty of them in the deck. And revealed off the top, just an Ottawara, unfortunately. Uh, so we've got... Well, that gives us enough to go for Airborne Aid and the Imperian Eagle. Potentially a bit late now, but... Yeah, let's do that. So we'll draw a boatload of cards. We do have Flash and our lands on tapping, thanks to the Awakening, assuming this player doesn't go down which I don't think he's going to now. Priority still being held up by this player with a single mana available. All right, so we weren't drawing into a free spell anyway, which makes me feel better. So let's throw out the Imperian Eagle. And now the white player throwing out that Caged Sun, so we did draw into it after all. We do have a little bit of counter magic here, but not too much means of protecting our board, unfortunately. A spectral Searchlight. Player adds a mana of any color. Chose himself to add green. So it could be that there's a fog effect that our opponent is going to be able to cast here. No, just casting a three visits at instant speed. All this because we couldn't land the tidal barracuda. So definitely make sure that you're not getting any discounts with your, where is it? With your mockingbird. You do have to be hard casting this. But it's a unique and interesting game at least. Angel of Vitality after that getting another Fly it into play and we'll double up the life gain. Makes a token with Olketra's Monument for card draw and life gain. So we'll see what we managed to get the group hug player down to. See if we should have gone all out on that guy. We will get two triggers from the Castrol at least. Alright, got him down to 10. So yeah, I think we might have been able to have rid of him. Uh, got both the players down to 10 actually. So this player with flying might be able to get rid of someone. Uh, we could put a... Plus counter onto one of his flyers to make sure that happens, actually. I want to strangely draw more cards here to try and get into some more interactions. So do we need the kanji in play? I don't think so. Let's go plus counter and card draw, I think. All right, just drawing into another land. And haven't made a land this turn, actually. So we can play the Tundra. And for one mana, we could play this. Or it's Wayfarer's Bauble, that's pretty much it, so might as well just get a bird into play. Put Lofty Denial in the deck because it's thematic, but this is the type of board state and it's Magic Online, so it tends to be a little bit more spiky with more expensive cards. This is the time that you'd wish it was a Dovin's Veto or an Arcane Denial or something. But put the um, Lofty Denial in simply because it's thematic. But if you care more about having better cards, then... Yeah, you should put those in the deck as opposed to the cards like Lofty Denial. Uh, hand the Rainbow Land over to the white player because I feel as though we have an understanding. At least I hope we do. Discard down to hand size. Awakening triggers at the beginning of the upkeep again. So Mono White player going to be able to take advantage of the Rainbow Veil as we pointed out previously. Has to tap down way fewer lands now. Thanks to having the Sun in play. Monumental Henge going to find something else. Don't think he's missed a hit with that yet. Although he does this time. Throws a land on the bottom. Is it only... 
gets any card from your graveyard on the bottom, so he is leaving Celestial Unicorn and the Defiler in the bin, which is noteworthy, so maybe has some white reanimation. Lauren has each of us draw a card, so it's definitely a two-headed giant game. Obelisk of Erd easily going to buff our birds, so might as well play this with Convoke. Tap down six of our birds to get this in for free and get a plus two, plus two buff on all of them. And we get a scry off the Artificer's Assistant when we do that because it is an historic spell. And all right, an Aerial Extortionist is very nice. Definitely keep that on top. And I want to get down the Ristic Study as soon as I can. Or do we just go for Consecrated Sphinx? Feel as though this player is easily able to play into a Ristic Study thanks to all the mana he's got. Still doing stuff at instant speed, Recruiter of the Guard. So I don't think he needs our help with the whole plus counter thing. Should be able to go wide at least on this player, which is the one that I think we want to get rid of. Draws with the Welcoming Vampire. Draws with Idol of Oblivion. Recruiter of the Guard tutors out a Knight Captain of Eos, able to prevent combat damage dealt this turn, which will be useful if we are going to be able to get a 1v1 going here. Might be able to switch off the infamous Cruel Claw as well. Not done there, a Moon Silver Key still has four mana floating before the Awakening resolves. So might be able to search up something and play it straight away. Looks as though that's what he's going for. Search for an artifact with a mana ability or a basic land. Finds himself a Sol Ring which can be played here. And now he's casting Dawn of a New Age as well. So it's going to have hope counters on it for the rest of the game most likely. Yeah, that is ten hope counters. We finally get the Obelisk of Erd into play. And of course named Bird. All of this happening on the upkeep. And the Awakening resolving. So do we want the Consecrated Sphinx? Or do we just draw with Winged Words? I think we can do the Winged Words and then... Yeah, I think we'll leave the Consecrated Sphinx for now against my better judgement. I don't think this player is going to be able to take us out. I've been wrong before though and... Like I keep saying, I don't think it's the two of us that should be looking at each other anyway. Ha, <laughs> a Black Blade Reforged. We each draw a card with the Lauren, so gets us into the Aerial Extortionist. Oh, that was this player. <laughs> this player was playing the Black Blade Reforged. Okay, can't equip it at instant speed at least. Thought that was the white player there. Yeah, it's curious that the infamous Cruel Claw keeps playing against his opponents at instant speed and showing his hand because it just draws attention to yourself really like i get that you need to maximize the amount of cards you can play when you've got instant speed and untapping and stuff but doing it during the main phase and before combat you're just kind of drawing your opponent's eye anyway linden into play i think that's the first time that that's hit play actually gonna gain a lot of life by swinging in this turn the good thing is a dawn of hope as well uh, the good thing is that if this player manages to take out both opponents, it means that we're able to it means that we're able to take full advantage of that and get him on the swing back immediately. So we can be quite reactionary here. This is where the turn order matters. Lightning Greaves, Archangel of Thune, life gain and plus counters gonna make things absolutely huge, so might be able to deal a good chunk of damage to us. Problem is by the time we see the thing swinging in towards us. The triggers will already be on the stack. Is paying into the Dawn of Hope for a card draw by the looks of it. Played Archangel of Thune many times and it always just eats spot removal immediately whenever I play it. So it'll be good to see it go off here because it's a really strong card in, well, life gain deck is the only deck you play it in really. So plus counter on each creature you control thanks to the Soul Warden. Protecting the Archangel of Thune that you just played with the Lightning Greaves. Shroud and Haste on that, and now going through to attacks with one mana floating, eight cards in hand, and a decent amount of devotion to white, so let's see if any of this comes in towards us. And let's see if the group hug player can do anything about it. Needs to be overextending, unlike what we did really. So, yeah, a load of flyers going in down the middle, and then tokens, it's the weenies going into the right, I think. So a bunch of life gain triggers, that's five life gain triggers, each of which will trigger the angel. Not worthy he didn't leave any flyers back whatsoever. So the first one resolves, Archangel of Thune and Dawn of Hope on the stack. Sylvan Carrier Tid thrown down at instant speed by the group hug player. 
see if we can get enough blockers into play and see if we can interfere with any of this. A bloom tender as well. And this is where it's really annoying that Magic Online doesn't show you where things are attacking while things are on the stack. Um, we should be allowed to let the stack empty before we can yeah, see where the attacks are going. Pretty sure he's only got two attackers going in here, so chump blocks are going to be able to be made. I'm not sure these are vigilance. I have no idea why he didn't attack in with those. But when the creatures enter, it's more Archangel of Thune to the Soul Warden. Could have tried to counter one of the creatures entering, but they had the mana held up for it, of course, so... Oh, they have the Guafa as well. We've already seen all of these cards. Yeah, so there's been a few chances to get rid of this player, and neither of us have taken advantage of it, unfortunately. Gonna be worth having the Aerial Extortionist in play as well before the Infamous or the Atali triggers, assuming that this player survives here, because we do get card advantage from players casting spells from outside their hand. A Veteran Explorer. When it dies, each player may search their library for two basics, put them onto the battlefield. So, plenty of chump blockers. So it's a case of seeing if we can draw into anything with this, I think. To see if we can interfere with this board at all, I doubt we can. Doubt we can make anything go through here. Obviously there's no means of flying counters in this deck that we can move over to any of this stuff, because, I mean, it's just a flying deck, we don't need flying counters. Um, Alright, well that player decided to scoop, so he never had anything apparently. And yeah, it was all the flyers swinging in down the middle, so... Yeah, could have had one flyer going in over here. These can now just be chump blocked. Let's draw with winged words and see if we can get into anything that might help here. Because we'd very much not like this player to have another turn. Uh, that's an Essior. Got three tree city as well, which is going to make a lot of mana if we get another turn. With this board state, I mean. Um, okay, don't think there's anything we're going to do. And I'd like to be able to cast spells during this player's turn, so I think instead of the Consecrated Sphinx, we're going to have to get rid of the Tidal Barracuda with the Aerial Extortionist, which does switch off our instant speed stuff. Everything apart from the actual instance, that is. Well, we're going to get some more basics into play at least. The Veteran Explorer is going to die. It's not whether they don't come in tapped either, so... Uh, let's see, that makes the Mono White player with double white and... Plenty of Devotion and 8 cards in hand, a lot more dangerous. That's where I regret putting the Lofty Denial in here, because we can't necessarily... We can't necessarily counter an Austere Command. Uh, let's just go for one of each, don't think it really matters. So we'll go through to the end step, see if there's anything that anyone wants to do. And then we'll decide what we want to do. Card draw from the Dawn of a New Age. We'll assume that the Rainbow Veil is coming back to us but was very much expecting this player to go down there. Okay, giving it back to this player, so maybe now it's these two versus us. Oh, okay, and then <laughs> choosing... Yeah, he had two triggers there, so... Because he tapped it twice, so the first trigger was here, and then we end up with it. Uh, let's go for the Consecrated Sphinx now. Does this only cost four mana? Yes, it does, because it's a flyer. Try and get into some more convincing means of protecting our board if we can. 98 life in this player's hand, and... Like I said, eight cards, so could do something in response, but decides to allow it in. The Aerial Extortionist is going to be three mana, meaning we'll have one left up for something like Essior or Lofty Denial. Or actually, Lofty Denial will cost two, won't it? Let's see what we draw with the Consecrated Sphinx off the Dawn of a New Age. They do have to draw a card here, so they can't dodge the Consecrated Sphinx. Well, speaking of card draw, a Well of Lost Dreams. Explore the vast lands as well. Each player looks at the top five cards of their library. Reveal a land and or instant. You can put the card revealed this way into your hand and the rest on the bottom. And that is some life gain as well. This is coming from the group hug player, as you might expect. <laughs> a perch protection. Well, would you look at that? Can we even afford it? Yeah, unfortunately not. We will be able to next turn though. There's a harsh mercy. Could just blow everything up. Generous gift as well. I think it has to be the perch protection here. Not worthy that these are revealed as well. So our opponents do know about them. Cleared a bunch of non-counter spells off the top of the library as well. Continuing to gain life and trigger the Archangel of Thune. Does not want to put mana into the Well of Lost Dreams I imagine. Although it looks like he might be doing. 
It is a May ability on the Consecrated Sphinx, so there's not much chance of us decking ourselves with that. 55 cards left in our library. I'm just praying that this Lofty Denial is of some relevance if we need it. Yeah, decides to go up to 13 cards in hand. There's the Consecrated Sphinx triggers. So maybe we'll get into a Mana Crypt or something here. Alright, a Fierce Guardianship makes me feel a bit better. The Murmuration we get back into after the Chaos Warp. A Stormscape Familiar. And Avon Mind Sensor along with Gwyir. So there we see Boromir. This is a pretty crazy couple of turns we've had. If no mana was spent to cast it, counter the spell. Alright, well, that's relevant with the Fierce Guardianship we've just drawn into. And the fact that we're desperate for drawing into some more mana with the Mana Crypt as well. Gaining two life, see if he puts more mana into the Well of Lost Dreams. Might be able to do something about the Boromir. Does not decide to have us draw more cards, unfortunately. Maybe he's going after a board wipe himself here. So we're just going to have to allow the Boromir into play, unfortunately. And if we have to use the Lofty Denial, then so be it. But I'd really, really like to get the Tidal Barracuda gone. So draw with the Enchantment, finally. Gets us into another couple of cards. And we've got some Indestructible in Safara. Hmm... We can do that at instant speed, so we're in the end step here. Let's go for, where is it now? The Aerial Extortionist. We do not have, huh, we don't have enough white, but it doesn't necessarily matter if we do this now or not. So, yeah, let's go for it. Although saying that, if we get rid of the uh, Tidal Barracuda, means that we're not going to be able to do this at instant speed, but we'll just have to risk it, I think. Aerial Extortionist does enter, gets rid of the Barracuda. So they'll still be able to cast it from Exile, but they're going to have to swallow up a decent amount of their mana to do it. Knight Captain of Eos comes into play as well in order to be able to stop combat damage and stuff. And with 5 mana floating, can still afford to pay for the Lofty Denial. Otherwise, I'd be tempted to counter this, but maybe we can use Cyclonic Rift or something, buy ourselves a turn. Path to Exile or something. Enters, creates a couple of soldier tokens, so Soul Warden just continuing to be one of the best cards in the game. One of the best cards in this game, I mean. Now, the question is, do we allow this player to draw so that we can potentially draw into more counterspell backup with the Consecrated Sphinx? So that we can better, or more likely, get through the Perch Protection? Because we can't rely on the Fierce Guardianship now, while Boromir is in play. Alright, a Witch Enchanter, so is he trying to switch this off as well? Because that messes up our plans with the Perch Protection. Can't see that there's anything else he's going to point that at though. So it might be time to finally use our Counter Spell, much as I might regret it, because I do really want to land this. Alright, so this is where, yeah, we might regret not holding up the Lofty Denial. Yep, just have to allow it through unfortunately. Because we were reliant on the Perch Protection, but if they get rid of the Awakening, then we're not going to be able to do it. Okay, goes after our Anthem effect. I'm not really bothered about that. We should be able to deal a decent chunk of damage without it. Obviously, there's been a bunch of creatures entering with ETBs here, so... Commander's currently a 24-24. Yeah, 24 powered flyers. Tokens are 22-22s. They're really big creatures at the moment. 120 life, 11 cards in hand. Alright, and paying in with his remaining 2 mana pays into the Well of Lost Dreams, so we get to draw 4 cards here. Which lets us see the Cyclonic Rift. So before the Aerial Extortionist resolves, we'll get down the Essior in order to try and protect our commander from spot removal. Scry 1 with the Artificer's Assistant is a Radiant Destiny, which I'll keep on top. The Anthem could be relevant. Like I said, there's lots of Lords and Anthems in the deck. So do we go for the Perch Protection now, or do we just go for the Cyclonic Rift? Because if we do manage to land that, it'll switch our Fierce Guardianship back on. We've got more chance of dodging a board wipe that they might do in response to that. Yeah, I think it's play we're going to have to go for here. We'll have four mana left up after a Cyclonic Rift. Didn't see what was revealed here, actually. There's an Echoing Deeps, not sure where that came from. A Generous Gift, potentially being held up as well. A discarded Hand Size, some Lands, a Daxos, a Claim Jumper as well, which must have been bounced previously. So, deciding to go through to the draw step here, allowing my opponent to potentially draw into some answers to what we've got. 
but there's every potential that we draw into answers to his answers. So there's a Sol Ring. Obviously knew about the Anthem. And we get to draw another couple of cards down to 37 in the library. And that is a Tashar, which could be good. Cloud Chaser Kestrel as well can blow up the Awakening. So I'll just play in a reactionary manner here. We'll see what our opponent's got, see how he wants to tap out. We could counter something potentially. Scramble Verse. Each non-land permanent choose a player at random. Then each player gains control of each permanent. <laughs> yeah, so should we just go for the perch protection in response to that? It makes things more interesting, doesn't it? Uh, while we're phased out, we'll gift an extra turn to this player against my better judgement. Can't cast the Cyclonic Rift, unfortunately. So, yeah, it, ideally we would have cast the Cyclonic Rift, bounced all the permanents, then this would have done near enough nothing, because we would have also phased out. But that entails a lot of mana, and uh, Azorius, not the best at generating a lot of mana. So let's see if this is a Delvin's Veto or something. Our opponents obviously saw the Perch Protection coming. Anything they can do to this, I'm going to assume they could have done to a Cyclonic Rift as well, though. Uh, Lauren, having this player draw a card in response to this. So looks like it's become a 2-on-1 against us, because obviously we're going to start going wide on the Mono White player. When they draw cards, we draw cards, though. So it might have been better having us draw the card with Lauren. Drew into a Battle Screech, which is a Sorcery. And just another Legendary Bird and a Lightning Greaves. So do we get the Ava Mind Sensor down here in response? I don't think that matters. Doesn't look as though our opponents are going to do anything here. Yeah, we can actually afford to hard cast the Fierce Guardianship now, so best hold up the mana. Prevent all combat damage that will be dealt this turn. And um, preventing it again. Then Boromir going to make everything indestructible. They do keep indestructible when they go over to this player's side of the field. But we can now afford a free Fierce Guardianship at least. If that is going to be of any relevance. Preventing the combat damage with the Eos again. Looks as though they're just using that to sacrifice as many soldiers as possible. So that this player doesn't gain control of them. And Stroke of Midnight onto the Consecrated Sphinx in response. I think we are fine to allow that. Best hold up counter magic for something more relevant. I think they do have the Generous Gift available as well. Spectral Searchlight going on to the stack in order to add a mana of any colour. Puts mana into the card draw on the Dawn of Hope. Alright, so that resolves. All the tokens come into play and do trigger all the ETBs, but we are phased out now. Our life total can't change and we gain protection from everything. It's just like a souped up Teferi's Protection. And it was better to give this player the extra turn there, I think, because if they did have counter magic, then they probably would have used it there. There was no guarantee that we could have landed ours. Didn't know that the Fierce Guardianship was going to end up being online. Might be that Kineos and Tiro can combo off with two extra turns, though. And we're running very low on the clock, so... At this point, the client starts to become very sluggish, and it's best that we just F6 through a turn anyway, without holding up any kind of interaction. Problem is, whenever... Soul Warden triggers or any life gain triggers, but it's mostly Soul Warden. It puts like three triggers on the stack and that's making things last a lot longer. Of course, you have to hold priority if you want the chance of being reactionary to anything your opponent's doing. But we've potentially, but we've potentially had Kineos and Tiro in the game for a lot longer now because if he gets hold of a lot of life gain stuff, he'll be able to gain a lot of life himself, of course. Um, but if he yeah, he'll want to take this player out, or get somewhere close to taking him out in order to gain that life. But that means he then loses the permanence. So, a bit of a balancing act for our opponent at this point. I don't know if we're going to be able to last long enough to have any relevance on the game after this. Going to have to start thinking about the types of plays we want to make, really. Um, probably want an Anthem effect in play next turn. And after all that, Scramble Verse finally resolves. How does the client manage with this? <laughs> we end up we end up with a bunch of permanents ourselves, including control of the Knight Captain of Eos, which which is about as perfect as we could have hoped for, I think. The Knight Captain of Eos is the thing that was gonna hold us back from winning, I think. Gain control of the skull clamp, so that is going on to the bloom tender. Yeah, he did check. It is still equipped to the welcoming vampire, so he did check that he can 
re-equip it while he has control of it. So draws another couple of cards. He is going to get an extra turn after this one. We've got the Sol Ring here as well, a means of making mana with the Spectral Searchlight. Don't think we're going to be making a token, but Idol of Oblivion can draw us a card if we do. Could sacrifice this for an Eldrazi as well, if we've got the spare mana. Right, so Flourishing. Don't think we've got any life gain triggers as it happens. Uh, a Baby Jace. Yeah, I don't think we've got any life gain triggers as it happens, so the Sol Warden is going to be very nice and easy to resolve. Target player draws a card, minusing down to draw himself. Does have the Lightning Greaves with the Archangel of Thune over here, so can gain 30 life with that this turn. Plays a Soul Ring of his own. And a Cultivate, just setting himself up for his extra turn, I think. Awakening, untaps everything. Howling Mine and Rites of Flourishing draws an additional card. And we're down to 9 minutes, so I don't know if we're longed for this game. Sure you can all appreciate, it's been a very complicated game to commentate. If we can manage to land the Cyclonic Rift next turn, we might have half a chance to buy ourselves enough time to just turn everything in sideways once or twice. The Awakening is over here now, which is relevant. A Bounce Land, and another Bounce Land. Minusing down with Baby Jace to draw a card again. Don't think we have any Soldier Birds, as it happens, which is relevant, just in case we need to rely on the Night Captain of Eos, but I, like I keep saying, I don't think we have long enough left on the clock to be... Taking advantage of Night Captain of Eos. Speaking of soldiers, there's one from the Dawn of Hope. So while Soul Warden will be triggering, we can't gain life thanks to the perch protection because our life total can't change. Now Generous Gift going onto the flyer while it doesn't have Indestructible. Generous Gift is going to put this back into... Hmm, I've just literally just yielded. <laughs> through my opponent's turn, I would have considered countering that, to be honest, because he obviously wants it in the bin again for a reason. God, and the client's going to lag on us now, we're going to lose too many minutes. Uh, yeah, I might have considered countering that, because maybe they'll be able to get it back into play, and therefore switch off combats again. So, yeah, now deciding to attack him with the flyers. Nowhere near enough to get rid of our opponent, though. Gains a couple of life to the attacks on Linden. Deciding to put mana into the Well of Lost Dreams, so he's up to 10 cards in hand here. He's taking advantage of the life gain with Archangel of Thune. So could probably have dedicated more to the board here. More to the red zone, I mean. With regards to your clock on Magic Online, you can save a lot of time by doing the auto yields depicted by the exclamation point here, but problem is, if you have a bunch of stuff on the stack and it's all auto yielded, then it can crash the client, so you have to be... It's a real balancing act, trying to get the client to behave itself and not totally crash and bug out on you. And the more permanence you have in play, the more likely it's going to happen as well. So people sometimes comment on how low my clock is, but it's because of things like that that people might not appreciate. So a 32 and a 31 powered flyer in the air. And barely puts a dent in our opponent's life total, takes him down to 71, but he's back up to 50 himself. Alright, going through to the end step, uh, might as well get down the Avon Mind Sensor here. The more flying creatures we have in play, the better, if we're going to try and one-shot at least one player out of the game. So, with Awakening on the stack, that is at the beginning of each player's upkeep, untap all creatures and lands, so we might as well tap down a bunch of mana here. Might as well Cyclonic Rift now with that mana because that'll dictate how we spend mana in the future during this turn, if this resolves or not. Alright, does resolve the Tidal Barracuda not in play anymore, so instants are not as worrisome for us. Um, can we do anything else at instant speed? It doesn't seem as though we can. So that 4 mana might as well go into the Skycat Sovereign. Alright, and this player decides to scoop, throw in the Mono White player to the Wolves. We might time out yet, so... Alright, but that player decided to scoop it up as well, so Cyclonic Rift saves the day as ever. All I was really looking to do there, with about 5 minutes left on the clock, was get as many Anthems into play as possible, and then take at least one player out. I was too busy commentating, so I couldn't do the maths while my opponents were doing their things and we were phased out. But yeah, get as many Anthems into play as possible. Get rid of a player, maybe two, probably not though. 
Maybe we wouldn't have needed the anthems because we did have massive white creatures from the mono white player thanks to that scramble verse. So the group hug player really playing into our hand there. Well, that was a pretty insane game. Hopefully you all enjoyed it, and hopefully I don't have too many issues editing the thing. Be sure to leave it a thumbs up and consider donating on Patreon if you're not already. Massive thank you to the patrons for their steadfast support of the channel. I'm Travel Kai. Thank you for watching.